sa iyong gandamin ipamalas Ang ang kinggaling Tumayong bunta pa ang harapin ng buhay Yakapin ang tagumpay Tulungan ang kapwa at bigyang halaga Huwag hatakin ng pababa Isipin huwag sana ang sarili lang Pakisama
Usang magtungan kita sa pagkabot Patayon lamang kita sa pagbantay Pagsalig sa Diyos ay nagibanugiya Sumaganda ang pagsuguro pag-unungsa Mayang Aga from Iloilo City. I am Marie Saladesmo from the National Museum of the Philippines, your host for the ninth session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference or PIQC. Today's session focuses on the theme Year of Filipino Pre-Colonial Ancestors. The PIQC 9 is entitled Coming Full Circle in the Philippines, Climate Change, Environmental Shifts, and Evidence of Human Adaptation will highlight the National Museum's recent studies on the material culture found in national collections, particularly in ethnology and archaeology and underwater cultural heritage. We are currently live on almost 100 Facebook pages, primarily at the National Quincentennial Committee, National Museum of the Philippines, Department of Foreign Affairs, and other foreign service posts. National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, among others. Just a few reminders. Everyone is encouraged to ask questions to our speakers. You may use the Zoom chat or the Q&A for this purpose. You may also use the chat to post your comments and insights. Attendance is automatically recorded by Zoom upon entry. Evaluations form, will be sent to your registered email addresses within 24 hours from the end of today's session. To start, let us give respect to the Philippine National Anthem. It will be followed by an ugayam performed by Sangguniang Panlalawiga member, El Pidio Quines Sr., the Ilocosur Provincial Indigenous Peoples Mandatory Representative. Kayo ang makita bunong, manipod o mamyanan, 
talagang gain ki abagatan mani ay podumaya agung gain tila o akadawyan kut in time agi iaman Okay, ini apa? Ayah, oh, kau yang mereka tuan. Ii, kau yang mereka intip nadi. Lah, kabla awak salun atau um kalau masa dah kayu angah maki dah bunuh. Tapi nabi nantiu te. En mali ay ti En malantam ka dati Tabi na kay ami Sa nga lubungan Hada kay ami Ita ta intay Ay rampakan Maika lima gasot atawin Pakasaritaan No, ayan na ana isurat Dagiti imun una Adang-adang tiap-apong tayo parnor Iti abagatan Ngam na ngay ngayid pa'y Daito yatabuno Ta isuti Pagto Tongtongan intay pag Sasaritaan Salsalita Ano og ogma Ay kaisan Ta ribukin gasut Atawin Sakbay adim manon Kinang lako Dagiti ng panoray ah Kaan ganaot kat adaanan na dayaw Kastamat ana daog Tabi biag iti Tagi mo nga dagiti tuli nga Entay na taudan Ribuk mo Kasut atawa Sakbay tinaka Sakupan Ada anda gitiap Apong tayo iti Bukod nga ilili Kain ka daw yan Ana isirib Nasirib nga Inda ulwan Dagiti lalakay nga Aabigan kastamat Adan babakas ay Dadan lukutan Daytoy dadaug Apakasaritaan Iti ay adayo nga ugma. Iti ay boksilan itadagiti mamasirib. Nga agsar sarita nga agtultuloy. Ah, mang sukisukin, mang iay pakita. May papan iti gayib jit. Kinabak na. Iti ay pulikin kaan na widan. Ano ang unag nga? Intay na ang taudan. Ak titipun kin. Agkay kaysa tayo ita. Amang talyaw mang itudo. Mang parnoy. Hapada pada amang big bigkin, mang pa 
kadayaw kada tay pasut iti. Entai nagapuan. Ramot a. Ah. Ma ang pabilig iti at damakin. Ma sakpayan. Ita nga kanito. Ketintay nga ron. Eh kanyawan. Eh ay paliwat kindan. At o oh, at kaisan ay wada ita at ayan ni. Apo oh, kabun yan. Nga. Nga ad ad da pai. Kumakin manay na yunan. Tigagutkin ayat iti. Panagadal tapno ag tultuloy a. Arambakan ti intay. Pakasaritaan. Kasta amat kuma. Nga intay lagi pa. Pasing kudunkin. Kas intay ribingan. Di panangaywan. Kin panang salak nim. Iti buksi bobokal nga. Ah, aglaw-law mang tagtaraon isok. O ti ay pagbiagan dagiti umaypay. Aka pututan. Hayatin tayo kin. Entay sa lakniban. O ti baybay karayan ka. Paan bantayan ni ina daga launay. Ngayon tayo na taudan. Nariingan na. Kaimulaan nga iti kamaud dyanan na isuti. Ipagsublyan ta. Isuti puno. Amang tagikwake. Pakaidulinan. Ay ay ugayam. Kuke ay kabunyan ka na yun natay kumanga. Os os do ngan tapapadong kumadi. Nasa liwanwan itakinti. Masangwanan. Traditions among indigenous peoples groups in the Cordillera region. It functions both as a message and a prayer that is delivered by the community's leader elders through chanted poetic verses. Addressing the participants of the event as well as the ancestors in Kabudia, which is interpreted as God or the congregation of spirits. The Ugayam is an indispensable component of all feasts and gatherings, except funerary occasions, and it is always performed as part of the opening program of such events. Commonly pertaining to affairs and topics that are well known to the elders, the lines comprising the Ugayam are traditionally crafted and sung extemporaneously by the chanter within the context of the occasion. Among some groups, folk narratives are also delivered in the form of or similar to the Ugayam. Mr. Kines, a member of the Itneg IP group, sung the Ugayam for this event. It covered the objectives of this conference and incorporated into the chant the Iloko language, which is the lingua franca of Northern Luzon. Why is the National Museum hosting the ninth session of BIQC? What are we going to learn from today's session? To answer these questions and to welcome the participants and speakers, let's listen to the Director General of the National Museum of the Philippines, Director Jeremy Barnes. Magandang araw sa inyong lahat. Araw sa inyong Hello lahat. to everyone. Hello to everyone. On behalf of the National Museum of the Philippines, the I wish to convey our warmest greetings to all of you who are joining us in another session 
of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. We at the National Museum are very honored to convene this leg of the PIQC and to present to the public the most recent studies on Filipino heritage made by our researchers and partners from other institutions. I am glad that we are conducting this very relevant activity in our celebration of the Year of Pre-Colonial Ancestors. As you know, the National Museum has been the main repository of so many artifacts that link us to our ancestors. Until now, we are continuously doing our best to effectively contribute to the deepening of our appreciation of Philippine pre-colonial history. This is especially true now that Philippine society and its approaches to people, culture, and the environment have greatly changed in a very diverse manner. We aim that a connection between our present generation and those who came before us be established and made material by means of rediscovering their worldviews, belief systems, crafts, and industry. Through the paper presentations that we are going to hear today, we at the National Museum earnestly desire that our reminiscing of the ingenuity and rich culture of our forebears this quincentennial year will be more meaningful. I hope that you will all enjoy and appreciate the presentations prepared today. Our researchers and associates have been working hard these days, even in the midst of this pandemic that we are all facing. We take pride in their efforts and creativity in making this possible, and indeed, I convey my gratitude to all who have worked towards what we will all be seeing today. And since the National Museum, of course, has finally opened its doors once again, let me take this opportunity to invite you all to come and visit us. While the presentations today will surely be interesting, especially as they will be aided by photographs and the experiences of our researchers in the field, our galleries and exhibitions have so much to offer to make you visualize creatively and feel how our ancestors lived. With that, thank you very much. Maraming salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you, Director Barnes, for the heartwarming welcome message. As mentioned by Director Barnes, researchers and associates of the National Museum have been working so hard even during this pandemic in order to share recent studies on the Madeira culture found in national collections. Many of us are very excited to learn from the different presenters. But before we proceed to the paper presentation, let us hear first a very relevant and timely topic from our keynote speaker, Dr. John Peterson. Dr. Peterson is an anthropological archaeologist specializing in historical eco ecology and landscape studies. He has worked in the American Southwest, Texas, Northern Mexico, China, Congo, Brazzaville, Ecuador, and currently in the Philippines. In the Philippines, he has conducted community archaeology programs through the University of San Carlos Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History Community Mapping and Heritage Preservation Program, and has worked extensively on heritage programs with the freely associated states of Micronesia in Pompeii, Yap, the Marianas, and also in Guam. He has served on the State of Texas State Board of Review the State of Hawaii Historic Preservation Board, the Guam Historical Preservation Board, and landmark commissions in San Elizario, El Paso, and Socorro, Texas. Dr. Peterson is currently president of the International Committee for Archaeological Heritage Management, a scientific committee of ECOMAS in support of the World Heritage Program. He is a visiting professor at the University of San Carlos and affiliate faculty with the Department of Anthropology, University of Hawaii, and editor of the Philippine Quarterly of Culture and Society. He is a research associate of the National Museum of the Philippines. His keynote presentation is entitled, Climate Change in the Philippines and Shaping the Field of Anthropology and Biogeography. Let's thank welcome you, Dr. Peterson. Uh, thank you, especially to uh, Director General.
Thank you and good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, especially to uh, Director thank General Barnes and, uh, and, and to the moderator for this session, uh, Audrey Tabata, for hosting, uh, uh, the, year for the, for hosting uh, the Year of the Filipino Ancestors. I'm going to speak, on climate, to speak on climate change and shaping and the, field the field of anthropology and biogeography. The most recent conference of the, the, co of the recent part, conference top 26 of the part, just met in Glasgow, Scotland. Just met in and in Glasgow, the latest Scotland. report of the Intergovernmental Panel the for Climate report Change, of the dire impacts are predicted for the dire planet. Impacts are predicted Some for fear the we've already gone past the Some point of easy we've return. Gone past Maybe the even to return. the point of reaching 2.4 degrees centigrade by 2030. That was an alarming headline. That's pretty grim. All the predictions point to hotter, drier weather in the Philippines, with extreme, flooding, weather, from flooding, with extreme flooding from intense storms, loaded with moisture from warmer seas, with moisture in most future scenarios. In most future but climate change has already ineradicably changed the Philippines. It's not some future threat. It's not. Some it's a persistent and recurring process. And recurring process. 700,000 years ago, sea level was higher than today, but 720,000 years ago, at least 100 meters lower than today, we can this graph from a recent publication. 22,000 years ago, during the last full glacial period, it was uh, over 130 was, uh, meters lower than today. Meters lower than today. In the climate change curve from the, the last 800,000 years, years, note the recurrence from cyclic climatic change relative to earth wobble and other predictable changes throughout the Pleistocene that have affected existing continental landmass positions. We now should be cooling according to these processes, but human-induced climate change has reversed that trend with massive CO2 and methane emissions from the modern era. There have been several periods when the land bridges gave access to humans or some hominid form of earlier humans to have walked into the archipelago. Then they were successively blocked by rising sea level, then reconnected again. These isolations and reconnections make the genome highly adaptive to changing connections with gene flow, alternating with island or founder effects. We have probably just begun to find the archeological remains of these people in places such as the Kalinga site and the Arubo site where flaked Ashley and tools were found in Nuevo Ecija, and anywhere in the Philippines where tektites are found. Otley Bayer was very prescient to recognize the significance of these for the earliest Philippines chronology. Otley Bayer was very prescient to recognize the significance of these for the earliest Philippines chronology. In Badian in Western Cebu, farmers showed us their treasures found in Highlands farm fields. Um, Bayer had noted a couple in the Guadalupe area in the report on tektites. Tektites were found in association with the Kalinga rhinoceros that helped date the site to 700,000 years ago. Some of these were found in farmers' fields on the Karkar Formation above uh, Badian. And we're, of course, constantly alert now to finding more because people collect them because they think they're oddities and perhaps worth a few dollars. Of course, most of these sites would be in the continental shelf or offshore and what was once the Sunda land bridge, and we'll probably never find them. We did mapping and probing of the Marigondon Cave in Cebu, now 40 meters below sea level, and found several thousand years old sediments, as well as geological features that helped us date the formation of the cave in a coral reef platform uh, when it was above uh, sea level. A coral reef coated with carbonates from flow within the emergent cave provided uranium thorium dates of these two periods and demonstrate the extreme swings of sea level from 60 meters above today's sea level to 130 meters below modern. Marigondon Cave, 40 meters below sea level, was once high and dry, 90 meters above the 22,000 year old sea level. You can see from this figure uh, that uh, Schultz did back in the 90s that dates the actual uh, terraces that one sees on the uh, eastern side of Cebu from the top of the Cordillera down to the sea. And the, these lowest ones date around 100,000, but the highest ones are three or 400,000 years ago. They were successively below sea level forming as coral reef platforms, but have because of tectonic uplift, but also the changing sea level, they're now far above sea level. And if you, if you also then uh, go beneath the present surface, we found a 60 meter reef platform and a 20 meter reef platform. And it's in the 20 meter reef platform that Morgondon Cave formed. We've got dates of about 126,000 years ago for the formation of the cave when it was when sea level was higher than today even, 
and uh, uh, higher enough to uh, to form a, a coral reef uh, platform uh, at some at the depth of 20 meters. But then the next date we got was 91,000 uh, when actually the uh, cave was above sea level uh, and uh, it allowed uh, uh, spring water to flow through the back of the cave and to uh, uh, basically form a flank margin cave that then was eroded out and uh, could have in fact been a cave for almost 80,000 years where people could have been living. We found six more of these caves along the Bohol Strait uh, opposite and along the same shoreline as Marigondon Cave and at about the same depth. So we, we in fact, envisioned as, as a kind of a valley of caves, uh, which could have hosted an, at least paleofauna, but possibly even human settlement during that period, 80,000 to say uh, 20,000 some years ago. From roughly 6,000 years ago to 3,000 and then 2,000 years ago, and I say that because often these changes are not gradual, they're punctuated, sea level overshot our current sea level by nearly two meters and then retreated to modern levels. Compared to prior sea level of 100 meters, this seems trivial, but the effect on shorelines and mangrove habitat was profound. If the changes were relatively sudden, mangrove would have been either drowned in saltwater or stranded in freshwater on retreat. Mangrove is slow to respond to these sudden changes. We think coastal communities from these periods were threatened, forcing them to explore for suitable habitat up and down the coasts of the South China Sea, expanding their networks and their reach throughout the region. They too appear to have carried a general Neolithic tradition around the region, much as earlier people carried genes and language into the northern Luzon Cordillera some 8,000 years ago. These people are thought to have been ancestral to coastal maritime and Neolithic peoples in the archipelago, but successive groups migrated through island Southeast Asia in reticulate patterns for the next few thousands of years, surfing along the ups and downs of climate-induced sea level change. By three or 4,000 years ago, maritime nomads along the coasts of South China were probably forced out by emergent polities in China that formed archaic walled towns and had begun to cultivate wet paddy rice. These nomads were the original interland peoples of the coast, much like the highlands people in the interior of Southeast Asia, especially those along the coast and the migration through mainland and Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia was expansive and rapid. Radiocarbon dates in the range of 2,500 to 3,200 years proliferate everywhere in the region, along with some shared cultural products and language. Bill Solheim's Noose and Tao best characterized the pattern of the period he identified as Sawin Kalanai, based on common red slip pottery and burial practices. They contributed to a dynamic element of Malayo-Polynesian language, cultural practice, and lifeways that joined a mix of peoples with a generalized Neolithic lifeway, as well as varying genomes, including Aita, as well as other subgroups that appear to have been conservative in maintaining their identity and genetic distance in the midst of new cultural and genetic pulses through the region. Were some of these the Austronesian migration? Maybe, but they didn't export complex rice farming, and they were certainly later than the purported 4,000-year-old sites proffered for their spread through the region. Anyway, it was people that moved, not languages or pot shirts, and few sites have been found along the coast for many period to connect the dots to near Oceania and the Western Pacific. Climate changes in the Philippines have often mirrored global trends, though not precisely. There have been exceptions emerging from local or regional phenomena. The Little Ice Age, as it's known in Europe, was powerful in the Philippines from 1300 uh, in the Christian era. But due to the volcanic eruption of the Rinjani Plateau in Indonesia, the intertropical convergence zone, a band of seasonal rainfall, drifted north into Luzon and the period was generally wetter, though more typically, it would have been drier and much hotter during that period. As the impact of the volcanoes diminished, however, rainfall was reduced over the region, especially during El Nino years. The adaptation of Ifuga rice farming on terraces watered by artesian springs was a very effective community buffer against climate change. Not only was it critical as a refugia from Spanish conquest, but it was a sustainable agricultural and cultural practice that maintained Ifugao traditional communities for centuries. What are the current expected trends for the Philippines and how will these impact settlement and also heritage sites and human communities? 
generally drier and hotter conditions with more frequent extreme storms, such as typhoons and monsoonal deluges are expected. But these will have local effects and must be downscaled for the regional expectations, in the words of climate scientists. In some cases, the local effects may be from distant events. The town of Vigan, for example, a World Heritage Site for its early Spanish town pattern, was built on the floodplain of the Abra River. Casual study of the floodplain reveals a history of abandoned meander channels, which you can see here, which go pretty much right through the old town of Vigan on the floodplain of the Abra. They threaded through the, through, the, through the course of the floodplain to the sea. At least one of these, if torrential rains in the Cordillera flooded the lower reaches of the river, could lead to breaching into the old channel and major flooding throughout the streets of Vigan. Another city within the meandering channels of a major stream is Butuan on the Agusan del Sur River. The scars of very ancient channels can be discerned on aerial LIDAR imagery. At least one of them contains the remains of 1,000 or so years old boats drowned by the river and buried beneath the present floodplain. Radiocarbon ages of the 10 boats in the channel mostly overlap. They may all have sunk on the same massive event upriver. Either a cataclysmic earthquake, volcanism, or super typhoon sent a deluge downstream that may have buried all the boats in one single event and then stranded the village of that time inland away from a new course of the river. Now Butuan City faces potential hazards within a dynamic fluvial environment. Environmental archaeology can help us to understand these long-term trends. Noting physical changes in the landscape and human interaction with the land and sea. Understanding the, la the past can help us perceive the future. The physical indicators like wave cut notches that show the two meter higher sea level from a few thousand years ago or shoreline sites well back from contemporary beaches can also help communities see what their homes will be like 20, 30, 40 years from now when sea level likely rises a meter or more from modern conditions. That realization promotes community adaptation, bottoms up shifts in residency. Promoting eco design for housing and communities in shady and green environments can contribute to more livable places in the face of increasing temperatures. Renewable houses of bamboo and nipa Echoes from even the recent past can be built after typhoons and floods, especially when the history of flooding can reveal to people where it is safe to build and where not. Uh, a recent uh, webinar featured uh, the mayor of Alcala, uh, who was now planting trees along the Cagayan on the higher terraces in order to try to promote uh, retention of the terraces and resist the flood water eroding the sides of the river as it, as it hurtles downstream during massive flooding. Also, many people, of course, are planting mangroves, another effective way to challenge climate change and to help preserve communities. We need all of these tools and more to adjust to the coming sea. Wave cut notches uh, show, for example, uh, these changes uh, above the late Holocene sea level stand. You can see where the apex of the uh, sea level where it was crashing into the uh, carbonate uh, platform beach and uh, we can actually date those notches. And this is why we know that there was higher sea level anywhere from two or three to 6,000 years ago. We are now terribly aware of the dangers of warming climate and now the imminence of danger as well. What is the best course to comprehend and adjust to this existential threat? The cold hard facts of our hotter future are grim. How do we adapt? What tools do we have? What will be our futures where we live now? There are few fixes available. Some have recommended sulfur particles aerosolized into the atmosphere, but even if it worked, it would only be a stopgap. Stop Eventually the heat would return. Some offer an optimistic practice for the future by celebrating what attorney Tony Oposa calls the world concert of good stories. The US Geological Survey recommends identifying bright spots to consider what communities and individuals can do, like planting mangroves or reforesting areas inland. The Panorama Program of ICOMOS and the IUCN support organizations for the UNESCO World Heritage Program is highlighting sustainable community practices and solutions that work to preserve heritage, biodiversity, and human community. These may start as small steps toward global change, especially where the big fix is elusive. But even small steps in our daily lives can impact the big picture of carbon pollution. 
We are adjusting, but our lives will need to acknowledge the limits to our customary activities like global travel, petrol fuels for transportation and electricity, and other obvious carbon loads. The National Museum has acknowledged its mission for a sustainable future and its programs that have flourished even during the pandemic. The pandemic, in fact, is like a big dress rehearsal for climate change adjustments. The National Museum has taken the opportunity to renew exhibits and to update collections management. Regionalization of the museum now hosts boasts several new museum facilities in Bohol, Cebu City, Iloilo, Zamboanga, and elsewhere so that museum services can be tailored to local communities. Outside tourism can also avail these new centers, but most importantly, the National Museum is increasingly becoming relevant and available to local communities. Some are calling this trend toward local, regional, and bottom-up tourism, nanotourism, or a creative critique to the current environmental, social, and economic downsides of conventional tourism as a participatory, locally-oriented, bottom-up alternative. This trend is <clears throat> critically important to our shared futures and our common past. The original ancient Filipino is still largely unknown, but perhaps can be known within the context of our understanding of past climate change and environmental limits, as well as opportunities. And there are valuable lessons there as well that we can examine for present day adaptation, like in the rice farming of the Ifugao Cordillera, or the ancient rice farmers in Andorion, who practiced rice squidden agriculture as retreat, floodplain retreat agriculture on the floodplains of the Cagayan River, as well as those clinging to perilous places along coasts and in river valleys. Anyway, we're all in this together and celebrate the National Museum of the Philippines as a leader in policies and practices contributing to climate change adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. From his presentation, we are reminded how climate change changed the Philippines as indicated by rising sea levels, among others. We've seen from his presentation how climate change affected the way of life of our ancestors and the physical spaces they lived in. Truly, understanding the past can help us spread the future with caution and live our lives today responsibly. We are reminded once again of the dangers of the warming climate or the climate crisis, so let us think of ways how we can reduce carbon pollution, among other measures. Let's have a short break. A 10-minute health break is perfect to think of questions you might want to ask Dr. Peterson for the plenary discussion. See you everyone after 10 minutes.
Iba rin ang takot sa iyong damdamin Ipamalas ang angkin galing Tumayo mong tapang harapin ng buhay At kapit ang tagumpay Tulungan ang kapat bigyang halaga Huwag hatakin ng pababa Isipin huwag sana ang sarili lang Pakisama't bayanihan Subukan nating isulong at ligawan ang Magandang bukas Ikaw at ako magkasama tayo Salubungin ang kinabukasan Bagay
webinar or comment on the Facebook Live of NQC 2021. Kindly indicate to who your question is for. We have two presenters this morning. We will conclude the morning session with a plenary discussion. Our moderator will collate your questions and try her best to have it all answered. Let's now proceed to paper presentations. The first research presentation is entitled Ancient Boats and Their Contemporary Permutations in Mindanao. The lead author is Bobby Orillaneda. His co-authors are Rachel Ann Jeline Ureta, Dr. Mary Jane Luis Bolinia, Maria Rosalinda Fernando, and Euphemia Tapili. Our presenter, Bobby Orillaneda, is a senior museum researcher and the officer everyone. in charge of the NMP Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division. He finished his master's in archaeology at the University of the Philippines. Currently, he is finishing his doctoral degree at the Center for Maritime Archaeology, University of Oxford. He is the president of the Kapusanan ng mga archaeologists sa Pilipinas Incorporated or Guild of Archaeologists in the Philippines. He is also a member of ICOMOS, Philippines International Committee on Underwater Cultural Heritage Management. His interests include Asian ceramics, Southeast Asian pre-colonial and colonial maritime trade, World War II shipwrecks, and the preservation and management of the Philippine underwater cultural heritage. Let's welcome Bobby Orillaneda. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to attend this webinar today. On behalf of my co-presenters, Dr. Mary Jane Luis Bologna, Ms. Rachel Ureta, Ms. Ifeme Catulin, and Ms. Rose Fernando, I'll be presenting our topic today, Ancient Boats and Their Contemporary Permutations in Mindanao. This presentation articulates the boat building techniques, maritime routes, modes of maritime exchange and utilization of watercraft from the 8th century until the present using archeological and ethnological evidence of excavated and currently in use boats in Mindanao, Southern Philippines. This includes the Butuan boats, which is dated from the 8th to 10th century CE, the Griffin, uh, which floundered in 1761, and the contemporary Lipa boats of the Sama de Laut of the Sulu Sea, which represents the evolution development, and contemporary use of boats in different settings. It also delves into the climate change that may have influenced the changes and adaptation of these vessels over the centuries. The Philippines is an archipelagic country, and the majority of Filipinos trace their roots mainly from the early boat people whose culture still persists today. Beneath the land and the territorial water of the Philippines lie numerous archaeological materials which form part of the country's national cultural heritage. These materials provide direct evidence of our predecessors' boat building and boat using skills and their active participation in the Southeast Asian region's prehistoric maritime trade networks. Let me start with the Butuan boats, which, which are considered national cultural treasure in 1987 based on Proclamation Number 86. Since the 1970s, the incomplete remains of at least 11 ancient wooden boats have been found buried in the floodplains of Barangay Libertad, Butuan City, all within one kilometer radius of each other. Unearthed by pot hunters searching for wooden coffins containing valuable grade goods, the boats were found beneath approximately 1.5 meters of compact clay and around 0.5 meters below the water table. This water light and low in oxygen environment aided in the preservation of the wooden remains for at least 1,000 years. At, as of this time, nine wooden houses have been exposed. So what you see here are the, are the photos of the Butuan boat, which was excavated in 1976 on your left, followed by the Butuan boat two in 1978, by the, the Butuan boat five in 1986, and most recently the Butuan boats four and nine in 2013. The Butuan boats were found in what was likely an old river that later eroded and changed course. They were probably abandoned and their useful parts stripped for reuse before natural processes 
bury the remains in sediment and preserve them, allowing us to learn more about our maritime past. More ancient boats may still be buried here. Thus, it is essential that they are protected against destruction caused by treasure hunting or land development. Because of this, the National Museum of the Philippines established the Butuan Archaeological Park, which is currently being expanded while in close coordination with local stakeholders. These are some of the materials that were recovered along the Butuan boats. There is only a small number, maybe due to the way it was buried, and maybe the vessel was emptied of its contents during abandonment. The objects include wooden objects such as wooden pegs on your left, wooden dowels, ropes, aranga pinata lashing, shiny sewe wares dated to the 9th century, animal remains, stone implement handles, stone objects, earthenware shirts, and wooden pegs. They may or may not be associated with the boats themselves. Boot one boats, one, two, four, five, and nine have plank edge joined with wooden dowels, such as illustrated here. These are the planks, and these are the wooden dowels. So they are joined by wooden dowels, all of the planks here. The boats are estimated to have been between 11 to 15 meters in length, with the exception of boat nine, which is at least twice the length. Plank-built boats are now rare in the Philippine archipelago and are constructed primarily in Batanes and in Sulu. Butuan boats one, two, four, and five were also built using the lash flag boat building tradition, such as illustrated here. A series of protruding lugs in here or tambuco are carved from the planks, bored with holes, and used to secure or lash the boat frames and other components as illustrated here. Lash flag boats of various sizes have been found throughout maritime Southeast Asia, and evidence of this boat building practice extends at least 1,500 years before declining the last century. The picture on your right is an artist's representation of the boat one boat. In 2011, another series of investigations were commenced under the theme, Reviving the Legacy of the Butuan Boats, as you can see in the upper photo. In 2013, another hull remain was discovered during the course of re-excavating Butuan Boat 4. So this is Butuan Boat 4 in here. This one is quite different from the others since, since it is significantly bigger and the type of wood is quite different, as you can see in the picture in your left. So if this is boot one boat four, this is the new, the new excavation, which they term as boot one boat nine. So this vessel is still undergoing research. So there are still data to be extracted to make definitive interpretations about the vessel. So the picture on your right shows the original boot one boats. And this one is a boot one boat nine, which is significantly bigger than the other boats. In the 1980s, wood from some of the Butuan boats were radiocarbon dated, but yielded confusing dates. Some were dated to the third century, while others were dated to the 13th century. To verify this, seven wood samples from five boats, as you can see on the left side of your skin, Butuan boat one, Butuan boat two, Butuan boat five, and Butuan boat four, as well as Butuan boat nine, were subjected to accelerator mass spectrometry carbon 14 dating. The 2014 results, which you can see on the right side of your screen, reveal a much more consistent range of dates that fall within or close to the 8th to the 10th centuries. So this is a calibrated age. This is where the samples were taken from, from the boat one boat one, from the boat one boat two, from the boat one boat five, from the boat one boat four, and from the boat one boat nine. So it's identified here. And this is the calibrated age, which ranges from the 8th century until the 10th century. This confirms the original boat five date. Wood samples were also identified, revealing that the boats were made from a variety of trees, all available in the Philippine archipelago and the neighboring region. 
Let me go back in terms of time timeline to explain how the Butuan boats are located where they are today. The map on your left shows the geological Butuan, Butuan map from the 7,000 to 1,000 years ago. You can see the flowing Agusan River in here. And on the right side, the two other major channels on the left side. The red dot, this one, shows the location of the present Libertad area where the Butuan boats were found. The yellow dot represents the Bonbon Shell Midden site that was also investigated by the National Museum Archaeologist, while the green dot represented the San Vicente archaeological site where Chinese ceramics were excavated that were dated contemporaneous with the Butuan boats. The map on your right shows Butuan between 1,000 and 500 years ago. You can see that some of the channels are already closed. So the, the ones in black here are already closed. The photo above shows the area in Bonbon where a shell maiden site was discovered so in here. Note that the former Bonbon River Channel is already gone and replaced by a road and rice field. So this is a road and of course this is a rice field. And from the geological study, this area here is the former Bonbon River Channel. The photos below show the Shell Midden site in here, beneath the residential houses and rice fields. The map on your left shows Butuan between the 17th and 18th century CE. Again, you can see the close, closure of river channels due to siltation. And the map on the right shows Butuan between the 19th century until the present. It is very clear that only the Agusan channel is still flowing continuously. There are other active tributaries, but are now very shallow and do not go far beyond inland. Now I will discuss on the Griffin shipwreck. Griffin is an English East India Company ship which sank in the Sulu Sea in here, near Basilan Island in 1761. According to historical sources, the vessel left England carrying packs of clothing and private trade on its way to Canton, China, where it, lo with, it was loaded with cargo composed mostly of tea. On the way back to Europe, Griffin was joined by five other ships. On board Griffin was Alexander Del Rimpolt, who was appointed to negotiate an agreement with the Sultan of Hulu. <clears throat> the agreement would allow the East India Company to freely trade and establish a trading port as Hulu. However, the fleet diverted from the traditional route and sailed via the east of Palawan, so they sailed here instead of here, and sailed the sea. However, upon arriving on a shallow area near Basilan Island, in here, Griffin struck a rock and rapidly sank. All the sailors were saved by the other ships, but the entire cargo was lost. They then continued with the plan in Hulo and founded the Freeport. In 1986, archaeological excavations were conducted by the National Museum of the Philippines and Frank Podio with his worldwide first team. The activities lasted for 14 months and exposed the shipwreck at a depth of approximately 15 meters. The half section, as you can see here on the left side, measures 29 meters long and was discovered under six meters of sand. So on the left side is the hull. On the middle photo is the excavation, the gripping. And on the right side, is you can see the in situ intact cargo of porcelain ceramics from the griffin. Thousands of artifacts were retrieved from the shipwreck, which mostly consist of tea chests and porcelain wares. During the 18th century, tea was highly regarded in England, a luxury and very expensive. Proof for the demand of tea, may also be gleaned by the number of porcelain tea sets retrieved from the cargo, as you can see on the photos below. As a background, 
Tea drinking became an alluring and relaxing pursuit by the Tang, Tang Dynasty period, which is in 1618 until 906 CE. During gatherings and conventions, people get to enjoy formal and elaborate tea drinking ceremonies prepared by tea masters. Over time, the consumption of tea spread from China into the rest of Asia and towards the Western world. The English East India Company, during its heyday in the 18th century, brought tea to every corner of the globe using company ships. The waters where the griffin floundered are often visited by the Sama de Laot or Bajau fishermen who use small dugout canoes and double or triggers for fishing. The flora and fauna on the coral barrier of griffin rocks are very typical in terms of the corals, anemone, and multicolored fish. There are also shoals of squid, rays, weed poisonous things, and highly poisonous snakes. Now I will discuss on the Sama de Laut. They are also called Bajau. They are both dwelling and are often referred to as sea nomads or sea gypsies, for their life is anchored in the sea. Sama is the general term for the inhabitants of Tawi Tawi, and de Laut means attached to the sea. They can also be found in parts in Basilan, Sulu, Zamboanga, and Davao in Mindanao, Bohol, Cebu, Iloilo and Negros in the Visayas, in Palawan, Manila, and other parts of Luzon. They are also scattered in the maritime corridors of Southeast Asia, specifically in Sabah, Malaysia, Sulawesi, Indonesia, the Eastern coast of Borneo, and coastal areas of the Southern Moluccas and Western Timor. The nomadic nature of the Sama de Laut makes it difficult to define the territorial waters. Despite this, they form moorages or boat dweller communities that are usually protected by coral reefs, which also serve as their source of food. The exposed, exposed part of the reef or a nearby beach area serves as a working area for boat building and playground. In the 1960s, Harry Arlo Nemo identified five moorages of the Sama de Laot in the southwestern Tawi Tawi, which is located here. This includes Luuk Tulay, Number one, Tungkalang. Number two, Lamion. Number three, Tugbangkaw. Number four, and Liuburan. Number five. The Sama de Laot has 15 types of boats. The largest are houseboats, and the smallest are miniature boats used as grave markers. Each boat has a specific name, but there is no general term for boat. The houseboats provide shelter and mobility, while fishing boats are for livelihood and transportation. Four types of boats are used by the Sama de Laot. Dalipa, which is the largest, the Jengging or the Jengjeng, Baluto, and Telang. Fishing boats are also used for fishing, trading, and transporting water containers. Although smaller, they serve as temporary shelter when houseboats are under repair. The Sama de Laut are highly skilled boat builders and expert navigators, relying on landmarks for short distance fishing trips and on the stars for long distance travel. Boat building is a skill usually taught to sons at a young age. Building a houseboat and a fishing boat is a requirement before marriage and raising a family, forming a part of the bride price. Each family specializes in a particular type of houseboat, but they are also familiar with constructing fishing boats. They regard their houseboats, fishing boats, jewelry, and household objects as their wealth. The Lepak boats are called, called, also called Hidlas, more commonly used by the land-dwelling Sama to refer to the boat. Aesthetically, it is perhaps the most attractive of all the households, with its flowing lines that sweep from, from the prominent pro or jungar, which can be here, which is the distinguishing feature of this boat. Interestingly, older Bajau claimed that it was not common among them 
before World War II and that it came into Sulu from Borneo. The outrigger Les Lipa probably evolved in a shallow reef environment. At any rate, it is the boat best adapted to such an environment found among the Tawi-Tawi Bajau. Its broad hull results in shallow displacement to allow easy movement through the shallow waters, which is located here, of the southern Sulu reefs. It is found in greatest numbers among those Bajau whose home marriages are located on extensive reefs. The absence of the outriggers makes it efficient as a fishing boat since most Tawi Tawi Bajau are not fishermen. Recently, the National Museum of the Philippines launched the exhibit entitled Intersecting Currents, the Sama de Lao and the Sulu Sea at the National Museum Western Southern Mindanao in Fort Pilar, Zamboanga City. As you can see, this exhibition explores the natural and cultural spheres of the Sama de Laot of southwestern Mindanao, Philippines, throughout the Sulu Sea and the maritime corridors of Southeast Asia, including the islands and coasts of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Borneo. When you are in the area, I hope you can find some time to visit this exhibition. These are some of the references that we used uh, for the literature background and for the presentation. Thank you so much, Bobby, for that comprehensive presentation on the boat building techniques maritime routes, modes of maritime exchange, and utilization of watercraft from the 8th century until the present, using the archaeological and ethnological evidence of ex cloth, examining its use, manufacture, and source. The lead author is Camille Calano. Her co-author Ivan Cultura, and John Ray Caliado. Camille is a museum researcher at the NMP Ethnology Division, where she is involved in the research, management, conservation, and restoration of the National Ethnographic Collection. She has been with the museum since 2015. Before her transfer to the Ethnology Division, she was a researcher at the Chemistry and Conservation Laboratory and Fine Arts Divisions, focusing on the documentation, condition assessment, preventive and minor conservation and restoration procedures of the National Fine Arts Collections. She is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in Philippine Arts at the University of the Philippines in Manila. Friends, let's welcome the presenter and lead author, Camille Calano. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of my behalf colleagues, Mary Testaro of the Ethnology Division, Ivan Cultura of the Archaeology Division, and John Ricalado of the Botany and National Herbarium Division, I, Camille Calano from the Ethnology Division of the National Museum of the Philippines, will present our paper entitled The Banton Cloth, Examining Its Use, Manufacture, and Source. The Banton Cloth was recovered in the island of Banton, province of Romblon in Central Philippines. A team from the Anthropology Division of the National Museum of the Philippines conducted an archaeological investigation on the reported burial site in 1961. The two small caves, labeled as Guiangan Cave 1 and Guiangan Cave 2, on the northeastern side of the island, were badly disturbed. Five years after, the NM received another report of a new site within the area that they visited in 1961. The new site was labeled as Guiangan Cave 3. From the three sites, they were able to recover wooden coffins, human skeletal remains with modified grania, gold ornaments, fragments of 14th to 15th century Chinese and Siamese jars, beads, turtle shell comb, coconut shell, bamboo flute, and a fragment of ikat dyed woven abaca cloth, believed to be a portion of a death blanket. The recovered human skeletal remains and associated material culture form part of the National Archaeological Collection 
under the care of Archaeology Division of the National Museum of the Philippines. The textile fragments, now more popularly known as the Banton cloth, with a relative dating from the late 13th to early 14th century, are considered as the oldest known textiles that exist in the Philippines. Fragment A is part of the National Archaeological Collection, while Fragment B is included in the National Ethnographic Collection. The two fragments were exhibited at the Habit Saplot Gallery of the Museum of the Filipino People, now NM of Anthropology, from 2000 to 2010. In 2010, together with 31 significant artifacts and eco facts from Philippine archaeological sites, the two textile fragments were declared National Cultural Treasure through Museum Declaration Number no. 3 2010. The Banton cloth are re exhibited at the Hibladang Line Filipino Gallery of the National Museum of Anthropology from 2013 to present. This paper aims to determine the use manufacture and source of the fragments to answer the often asked question, if the Banton cloths were locally woven or trade goods. It specifically aims to number one, identify the materials used, the dyeing and weaving techniques, techniques employed, the type of loom used, and the visible designs and patterns. Number two, determine the possible sources of the fibers and dyes. And number three, Compare the fragments with the available textiles in the National Ethnographic Collection of similar fibers, weaving and dyeing techniques, designs and patterns, and function. The field and inventory reports on the Guyangan Cave Complex in, in the 1960s were reviewed as well as the other published and unpublished work works on the site, on the human skeletal remains, and on the associated materials. The two fragments were visually examined, measured, described, assessed, and photo documented using the inventory form for ethnographic collection. Digital microscopy using Dynalite AM4113T-FV2W was conducted to closely examine the warp and weft, the colors, and the weaving techniques employed. The condition of the fragments, patterns, and designs were also noted during the visual and digital examinations. In determining the possible sources of fibers and dyes, the fragments were compared to the available textiles from the National Ethnographic Collection of the same material, weaving and dyeing techniques, design and motives, and function. This paper aims to provide a more detailed description of the two textile fragments to establish their provenance, manufacture, and use. The researchers coordinated with the textile testing laboratory in Manila on the identification of the fibers and dyes used type of weave employed, and microscopic cross-sectional view of the fibers. But due to the required sample size, which is at least 45 by 21 centimeters or A4 size, the said tests were omitted in the study. Due to the fragile condition and national cultural treasure status of the textile fragments, the samples to be collected are limited to loose fibers. Dynolite was used in the digital, digital examination of the textiles, but the collected loose fibers will be examined under the scan and electronic microscope of the National Museum of Natural History after its preventive maintenance, hopefully next year. The Banton cloth from the Archaeology Division with accession number BNGI 11, 1961-F-11 will be referred to as Fragment A. And the other Banton cloth from the Ethnology Division with that accession number will be referred to as Fragment B. Fragment A was recovered in Guyangan Cave Complex in Banton Island, Rombron in 1961 as manifested by the assigned field number BNGI 11 and accession number 1961F11. BN stands for Banton, GI for Guyangan Cave 1, and 11 as the 11th item recovered from that particular site. 1961 refers to the year of recovery, F for the excavated archaeological collection, and 11 as its numerical value in the archaeological specimen inventory record. Both the warp and the weft threads of fragment A are made of abaca fibers. The warp threads are natural or undyed, and dyed red, black, red and black, while the weft threads are all natural or undyed, with discoloration in some of its parts. The maximum length of fragment A is 81 cm and its maximum width is 21 cm. The warp threads were tie-dyed in red and black prior to weaving. The weaving technique is plain weave or one over one. 
Ikat or tie-dye designs are visible on the red and black warp threads. Rating the condition of the fragment. A fragment A from 1 to 5, with 1 as very poor and 5 as very good condition, it is rated as 2 for its fragile state but more stable condition compared to fragment B. Fragment B has no accession number from the records of the Ethnology Division. Both the warp and the weft threads are also made of abaca fibers. The warp threads are natural or undyed and dyed red and black while the weft threads are dyed black. Discoloration is also observed on both the warp and the weft threads. The maximum length of fragment B is 73 cm and its maximum width is 56 cm. The warp threads were also tie dyed in red and black and the weft threads were dyed black prior to weaving. The weaving technique employed in fragment B is also plain weave or one over one. Ikat or tie dye designs are visible on the red and black warp threads. The condition of fragment B is one because of its more fragile and unstable state compared to fragment A. The image of fragment A on the left shows the areas where the microscopic images of the different colors were taken and the table on the right are the captured images of the natural or undyed red and black warp and natural or undyed web threads of fragment A using dinolite or digital microscopy at 50 times magnification. The image of fragment B on the left shows the areas where the microscopic images of the different colors were taken and the table on the right are the captured images of the natural red and black warp and natural web threads of fragment B using dinolite or digital digital microscopy at 50 times magnification. We selected four abaca woven cloth, cloths with warp e-cut designs using natural dyes from the National Ethnographic Collection to compare with fragments A and B. A bagobo dagmay collected from Davao in 1903, a blaan tabi woven by manalikhanang bayan yabing masalundulo when she was 12 years old, Amandaya Dagmay, also from Davao and collected in 1914, and the Dinalak from the Tiboli of Lake Cebu in South Cotabato. The table shows the microscopic images taken from the four textiles at random spots for the natural and dyed red and black warp and dyed black weft threads. From the captured images, fragment B, Bagobo, Blaan, Mandaya, and Tiboli use dyed black abaca threads as weft. Fragment A is different from fragment B and the four textiles from Mindanao because of the natural or undyed weft threads. Based on the recent documentation of the National Museum Ethnology Division researchers among the Blaan of Sarangani and Tiboli of South Cotabato, the weavers used dyed black weft threads in their abaca woven textiles similar to fragment B. Indigo dyed cotton warp ikat were documented among the Bontok Ibaloy, Ifugao, and Isinai. These types of textiles are funerary blankets or shrouds intended for the kadangyan or kachangyan or baknang or those belonging to the upper class. We selected the cotton blanket kinutian or in, in ladang from Banawe, Ifugao, and shroud from Bontok, Mountain Province, for the representative sample from Northern Luzon to compare with fragments A and B due to the ikat dye designs or patterns the use of natural dyes, and their function as funerary textiles. Both the warp and the weft of the cotton cloth from the Bontok and Ifugao are twisted or spun in contrast to the unspun abaca fibers of fragments A and B. The Ifugao death blanket is tightly woven compared to the Bontok shroud. From the captured images, fragments A and B are definitely not made of cotton fibers. Ikat was also employed in silk fabrics, particularly on the Malong Andon and Babalodan or Banalodan of the Maranao of Lanao del Sur. These two tubular skirts were selected because of the presence of the ikat dyed threads and the use of natural dyes for the Malong Andon. Malong Andon is characterized by weft ikat, while the Binaludan tube skirt, fragments A and B, and other examined abaca woven cloth from Mindanao and cotton cloths from the nor northern Luzon employed warp ikat. It is also clear from the captured images that fragments A and B are not made of silk. The last two textiles that we selected from the National Ethnographic Collection to compare with fragments A and B are the bast belt of the Bontok that was also collected from the Ifugao and Itneg 
and the raffia panel from Banton Island, Rumplon. The raffia panel was selected for there are few raffia weavers in Banton, but they cannot recall if any of any story of abaca weaving in the island. The fibers of the raffia panel are undyed, unspun, similar to, to abaca fibers, and the gaps between the fibers are wider compared with abaca, silk, bast, and cotton woven textiles, except from the bontok cotton shroud. The bast fibers were also spun and tightly twisted, similar to the cotton blanket of the ifugao. Fragments A and B are somewhat similar to the captured image of raffia. In Madagascar, raffia was woven with warp ikat, but the tradition died out in the last century, and this was attributed to their link with Indonesia. In Banton, the DTI introduced the use of synthetic dyes to the raffia weavers, but most of the time, the fibers are not dyed. Prehistoric weaving traditions in the Philippines are evidenced through the recovery of spinning tools, particularly spindle whirls, from several archaeological sites across the country. Spindle whirls serve as the weighted part of the tool used in spinning fibers into thread. These are usually made of terracotta or earthenware, stone, or lead, and have perforation in the middle where a stick is being inserted. Such materials were covered from archaeological excavations in the Neolithic sites of Batanes Islands and Cagayan Valley, the, and protohistoric sites such as Bolindao, Pangasinan, Porak, Pampanga, Santa Ana, Manila, Palatagan, Batangas, Palawan, Santa Cruz, Marinduque, Otan, Iloilo, and Botuan City. On the right are images of a spindle whirl recovered from Balingase site in Bolindao, Pangasinan. There are also samples of spindles in the National Ethnographic Collection gathered from the Ifugao in a locally called Tobayan and Iloko called Tabayan. The whirls are made of wood, stone, and sometimes lead. Vast fiber is still attached in the spindle from Ifugao, while that from San Fernando was used for cotton. And based on the captured images, the spun threads are bast, cotton, and silk. Abaca and raffia are unspun. Abaca, or Musa Textilis Ni, or its fibers, locally called lanot in central and western Visayas and some parts of Mindanao, was widely used as weaving material even before the colonial period. From the Dictionary of Philippine Plant Names by Dr. Domingo Madulid, former chief of the Botany and National Herbarium Division of the National Museum of the Philippines, groups from Batanes, Ivatan, Tuholo, Tausug, have local terms for abaca either referring to the plant or it, to its fibers. The Maranao, Magindanao, and Ilanun, known for their woven cotton and silk textiles, extensively used abaca before the introduction of cotton and silk through trade. The Yakan group, with their complex woven cotton textiles, also used abaca until the Second World War. Bicol and Mindoro in Luzon are also mentioned in historical accounts as major sources of abaca fibers and woven abaca cloth. At present, the Lumad groups in Mindanao continue the tradition of abaca weaving using natural dyes in their warp ikat textiles. The map from the Hiblan Online Filipino catalog shows the areas of traditional and adapted fiber source cultivation and use including abaca, one of the six fibers used in textile production in the country. Warinda is the main source of the color red and its use vary from claret to maroon to chocolate brown. The inner layer of the roots of the plant is used in preparing the dye bath with lime or wood wash. It may take days or weeks to achieve the desired depth of red. Red is a color of power, a symbol of warriors, village heads or leaders, and women healers. Morinda is a, is a patot in a loco, si karig among the bagobo, and sa kalig among the mandaya. Indigo is one of the three traditional dye stuffs common among the ethno-linguistic groups in the country. Morinda and yellow ginger are the other two common dye stuffs. Indigo is called kunarum in Balaan, tayong among the Itnek or Tingyan and Iloko, and tayong tayungan or Tugun among Bicolano communities. It is the main source of the colors ranging from blue to blue-black. Blue is significant among the groups in the Caldera. 
Indigo dyed textiles are reserved from the upper ranks, particularly the death blanket or shroud. The significance of red and blue will be further explained by the present presenters in the afternoon session. Fragments A and B were probably woven using a backstrap or tension loom similar to the looms used by the groups in Mindanao. Among the Mandaya, they have a wooden frame where the loom is attached. For the Tiboli, one end is attached to a post or a wall and the strap is attached to the lower back of the weaver. But the observed designs on the black bands of the fragment A are S and inverted S and double X and series of triangles on the undyed band in between the red bands near the long edge of the fra fragment. The S design series of triangles and diamonds and stylized crocodile design noted on fragment B are also on the black bands. The designs were ap applied through resist dyeing before weaving. The S and X designs were also observed on the death blankets of the Ifugao and Bontok, while the stylized crocodile design was documented among the Mandaya, Bagobo, Blaan, and Tiboli. From the visual microscopic e examinations of fragments A and B, the two fragments are most probably made of abaca, and the red and black dyes used in both textiles are natural dyes. Resist dyeing or warp ikat was employed and, and the weaving technique is plain or one over one, done most probably on a backstrap or tension loom. The weft used in fragment A is natural or undyed, while the weft on a fragment B is dyed black. Based on the weft threads, the two fragments are separate textiles. Compared with the woven abaca textiles from Mindanao, fragment B is more likely from Mindanao. For the selected textiles from Bagobo, Blaan, Mandaya, and Tiboli, also use dyed black fibers for the weft. And based on the recent documentation of the NMP Ethnology Division researchers among the Blaan of Sarangani and Tiboli of South Cotabato, the weavers used dyed black weft threads in their abaca woven textiles with warp, with warp ikat. For fragment A, we have to look for samples of abaca woven cloth from Mindoro, Bicol of Panay Island, to compare its warp and weft of, or abaca woven cloth from Indonesia or other Southeast Asian countries to identify its source. It is possible that fragments A and B are funerary blankets or shrouds because of the documented burial tradition and practices in the country of covering, wrapping, and or including textiles among the pabaon for the departed. Ika textiles are prized heirlooms because it was believed to possess protective properties and was worn as a talisman. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Camille. We learned from the presentation how the Bantan cloth was used, manufactured, and sourced by comparing it to the available textiles in the National Ethnographic Collection. The next time we see hand-woven clothes, let's check its patterns and compare it to the earliest existing specimen of warp tie-dye textile in the Southeast Asian region. Camille, congratulations also to your team. I hope everyone is ready for their questions. May I call on Audrey Tomada, the head of National Museum Bohol, to facilitate the plenary discussion. Let us all welcome once again our speakers, Dr. Peterson, Bobby, and Camille. Good morning. Mayong buntag sa tanan. So I am Audrey. I am here in Bohol. So um, are our speakers already here? Okay. So again, good morning to all, especially to our distinguished speakers for this morning's panel on coming full circle in the Philippines. So this is a session on the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors convened by the National Museum of the Philippines highlighting recent studies on the material culture found in our national collections. So thank you, Dr. John Peterson, for your keynote address and to the presenters who are also my colleagues at the National Museum, 
Sir Bobby Orellaneda and his co-authors and Ms. Camille Calano and her team. So thank you all for giving us a morning full of insights. Um, also, thank you to our audience and participants. So I've seen here um, some from Pangasinan, Iloilo, Sarangani, Quezon City, Bacolod, Davao del Sur, Valenzuela, Palo Leite, from Rizal, Tuau, Cagayan, Antipolo, Batangas, Legaspi. So hello to all of you. And thank you for tuning in to our PIQC session nine. Again, we are currently live on numerous Facebook pages and we encourage you to send in your questions here on the Facebook pages of the National Quincentennial Committee, the National Museum of the Philippines. And of course, you may use the Zoom chat or the Q&A for this purpose. So uh, we also have um, meetings from the University of San Carlos in Cebu City. So, okay, I guess we have for our first question, this was sent through Zoom chat a while ago after uh, Dr. Peterson's presentation. This is from Jimbo Fatalia. So he says, um, thank you, Dr. P Peterson, from your experience working in the field, I am curious to know accounts about how indigenous knowledge and local communities may help inform climate change mitigation efforts at present, particularly through the lens of ecological anthropology. Thank you, Jimbo. I, and thank you, Audrey, nice to see you. I, uh, <laughs> I think there are lots of examples already accumulating about how indigenous perceptions of the landscape uh, can be really, really fruitful in, in developing uh, resilience for communities because many times these have been done over many centuries or millennia by indigenous people. Of course, there's a famous example of the uh, Moken in the Thai coast who, who uh, knew to leave the shore and go up into the, the uh, hills along the shore when the uh, tsunami struck a few years ago. Uh, they saw the sea going out. They knew exactly what that meant, not because they had ever seen it, but because they had a, an indigenous uh, uh, knowledge of that, perhaps uh, oral uh, history, perhaps just a sense. That's one good example. Uh, I worked with some uh, Pai Pai uh, uh, tribes in Baja California several years ago, asked about the environment. They said, uh, you know, you have to realize the environment is, a, is, is processes. It's like the wind. It's not resources. It's not things. And we, as indigenous people, we, we learn how to experience and understand those processes and changes. So long-term changes in temperature, long-term changes in aridity or rainfall are things that people, uh, especially with the, uh, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, incorporate into their tribal and personal life experiences. So one must be very mindful of it. It's probably served very well for people to uh, have uh, not just survived, but develop sustainable life ways. So the idea that certain kinds of trees, certain kinds of plantings, certain kinds of uh, certain ways of treating the shoreline, certain ways to fish, uh, all are things that are learned over many, many, many years and generations. And if it weren't sustainable, they would not have survived, of course. Uh, but they have developed uh, these sustainable practices. So there may be things that are difficult to quantify. So we need to be uh, very mindful of just watching how communities sustain themselves. And at the same time, they're very, my experience, these communities are often extremely open to new uh, uh, data, new information. They are, they can, they are and can become citizen scientists very quickly recruited into projects uh, because they have keen observation. So looking at the wave cut notches, for example, is already second knowledge to people that, that the sea had been higher at some earlier time. But uh, I think they are able to, uh, uh, come up with ways to to deal with that, to adjust to that by moving inland or outland. And of course, they're living in a low, more low-tech environment, so that helps too. They're not rebuilding uh, 
um, resort hotels along the coast, thank goodness. <laughs> that one's going to be hard to develop resilience for. As the sea level enters the lobbies, I think they're going to have to like tout them as uh, aquarium resorts or something. Uh, they're not easily moved. But Belial along the coast are, and uh, so I think there are some ways to deal with that uh, uh, heat. We, we've saw in the last few years incredible heat in Tegegarau. It, it's already very hot and unpleasant most years there, but now even more so. Uh, moving out during those periods may be the most adaptive thing to do. Uh, moving into air conditioning means another load on uh, usually carbon producing power sources. Uh, these are challenging things for our whole society, but I do think we can learn a lot if we live in uh, Balai houses, if we use native materials, bamboo, nipa thatch, and so forth. Those are houses that are cooler, uh, especially if situated according to the winds and so forth. So at least for low density uh, living, I think there are many things we can learn from indigenous communities. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, for that comprehensive answer. <laughs> so our next question is addressed to again to Dr. John. Uh, how does, from Piven Jane Sarong, how does the global climatic changes influence the challenges in addressing gaps of archaeological and biogeographical research in the Philippines? <coughs> the, there's a real data gap, unfortunately, in global models for the Western Pacific. The Philippines is beginning to catch up to that, but for a long time there wasn't much data coming out of the Philippines. I think there are some excellent climate scientists here uh, who are beginning to address that issue, uh, but we need lots of good data from local uh, situations, local conditions, and once we have that, it'll be easier to build models that can be applied to the region and that can be downloaded to specific places. Right now, we don't have uh, enough details, enough uh, defined uh, or definite data, but uh, it's catching up. So many of the global trends are based on uh, lots of data from places like the U.S., of course, or uh, other areas like Europe. Um, the Western Pacific, it generates much of the climate change around the world, and one would think this would be a target for more uh, definitive data, uh, but it's just beginning to be. There are ocean sensors, thousands of them around the world in different places. These send data on, on sea level, uh, or excuse me, sea, uh, well, actually sea level, but sea currents, sea temperatures, salinity, uh, acidity, and so forth, to satellites. These are now beginning to be compiled in global models, uh, and we'll begin to see more and more how, how ENSO patterns, El Nino versus La Nina patterns, and the intertropical convergence zone that I mentioned in my lecture, uh, how these influence global changes, and then in turn, how these may be contributing to the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturn process that uh, could, could literally stall uh, climate on a dime in a very quick fashion. And, and I think one other thing that we need to learn from these global patterns that we can get a lot of data from here in the Philippines is the punctuated character of the change. We like to think of it as gradual. People say, oh, in 2030, the sea will be more acidic and we won't be able to eat oysters. They won't be making shells. Well, may be true, but there may be threshold stages, threshold points where that happens rapidly, or threshold points where, where temperatures rise rapidly or sea level rises rapidly because of collapses of both Arctic and Antarctic uh, ice mass. Um, so we have to think, uh, we have to be looking for these, uh, uh, these threshold points. There are some models that show that if some of the mass uh, in Antarctica collapsed, um, Overnight, sea levels could rise 20 feet worldwide. That's, that's a horrible thought, but it's possible. It's within the realm of models. So we just need that more defined data to begin to look at the, the changes globally and then begin to try to accumulate more data within the Philippines specifically. And one way we can do that is from archaeological sites. So we're trying to, we're trying to get involved in that discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Our next question is from Harold Buenvenida. This is from the Zoom, Zoom chat. My question for Ms. Camille, in your research with textiles, have you ever come across a fabric called Suerte, which is produced during the Galleon trade in the town of Panay, Capis, Panay Island, which is near in Romblon? 
Hello. Hi, thank you for yes. the question, Mr. Buenvenida. Um, or, uh, the, the textiles we use to compare fragments A and B of Bantan cloth uh, are limited to the National Ethnographic Collection, so we're not able to come across the said fabric, survey. But if given the opportunity to examine a fabric and compare it to the Bantan cloths, we are open. So if you have access <laughs> to the said cloth, maybe we can um, compare it or you know collaborate in the future. Yeah. Thank you for okay. the idea. Thank you, Miss. So we we'll, we'll look into that. Maybe he has a follow up question later. So let's proceed to the next question for Dr. Orillaneda. So this is a question um, from Iloco. So do you have plans of covering more sites across the country to expand your research on our ancient boats? How far have you gone on this research in Luzon? Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you, James, for your um, question. Yes, definitely. Um, the National Museum has been carrying out um, shipwreck investigations since the 1980s until, uh, of course, the present. And we have uncovered uh, shipwrecks dated from the 8th century, such as the Bitwan boats that I mentioned, until the Second World War, where we are currently investigating. Um, in terms of sites in Luzon, we have uh, a few, uh, from Manila galleons to trade vessels, uh, from the 15th century, from the 16th century, but mostly on the Western side. Uh, definitely we have plans to do more research um, in terms of not only shipwreck investigations, but also the maritime landscapes and so on. And our, some of our colleagues, uh, like Dr. Mix Tanilao, uh, who will speak later, uh, has also investigated a uh, shipwreck in the North. So um, I'm not sure if he's going to present that, but there are uh, current investigations and we are doing more uh, research. But of course, this is contingent with our, our situation, health situation right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bobby. Uh, next question is for Ms. Camille. So this is from Giovanni Kifutong. So in terms of clothing, which or what is more acceptable, the value of economic purpose for income generating of these groups of IPs, as well as promoting the use, the use of such materials, or morally right to preserve and conserve the distinct identity of such tribes through protection of this inherent indigenous learning and skills. Thank you for the question. I'd like to um, request my colleague and the lead author of our paper, Ms. Maricas Tao, Okay. Ms. Tess, are you on? I think she has audio problems. Is Ms. Tess on? So perhaps I think she has problems with her audio. Siguro we can ask her to turn off her audio first. <laughs> so we cannot hear anything actually. Um, Maybe she can just type in the answer. On the okay, yeah, yes. Thank you. So we have um Ms. Tess, there there is in the Q and A. You can type your answer there in this case. So okay. Next question. So we have another question, I think, for the for you, Ms. Camille. So the abaca is one of the most used material in producing fabric in the pre-colonial times, as mentioned earlier. It was just last year that it was put in spotlight when a group of entrepreneurs used the said material for face mask as an alternative to disposable medical masks for non-medical use. So to Ms. Camille, what do you think is the future of the abaca industry? 
when a lot of Filipinos are trying to switch to traditional green and sustainable materials as basis of the products they buy and use. Thank you for the question. Uh, personally, I think uh, it's uh, nice to know that uh, abaka is being used again uh, instead of you know synthetic fabrics uh, for the purposes of um, sustainability. So uh, it's also nice to you know uh, re recall or um, practice our traditional uh, weaving techniques and the use of um, uh, natural threads and even dyes. So with our paper, we are uh, trying to research more on the use of dyes. And with this uh, emergence of um, making face masks, and it's nice to know that uh, people are using abaca now. So with that, um, we're just continu continuing our traditions, our tradition when it comes to the use of abaca. So I think it, it has a, you know, a strong, um, or a, wait, we say a bright future when it comes to the use of abaca. So I think it's really good to know that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So our next question, this was sent um, through chat. Um, good morning, Dr. Peterson. Based on material evidence and or historical accounts, could you cite a few examples of Philippine sites with evidence of inhabitants adapting or working through inundation or constant flooding in their area? And then sites where abandonment became the best course of action for the people living there. Thank you. Well, that's a tough one. Uh, but I would say that Cagayan Valley is a good example. Uh, we know from geomorphological studies uh, in the river above to Gagarao, actually, that the channel, <coughs> every 10 years, it floods so often every year or so much every year that the channel actually migrates about 300 meters from side to side uh, in a given year. I mean, in a given decade. And this is court. This, of course, is is gouging out terraces on the right side and left side as it goes from edge to edge, but through the middle, and then redepositing those soils downhill, down slope. So when the Andorian site was deposited 3,200, 3,400 years ago in that era, uh, it was on a stable alluvial terrace. But the nice thing is, it was buried by one of those floods crossing back the other way. So rivers downcut and then they bury. So I think they adapted very well to that changing condition. Uh, my, uh, my idea is they were using uh, uh, flood retreat farming. Uh, it's practiced many, many places around the world. Uh, it's basically when a river overflows onto a floodplain. Uh, generally, the soils are exposed. There's moisture there for a good while. People can sow seeds in that area and uh, they'll germinate. And if they're short season plants, they can actually produce crop or fruit uh, before the moisture all disappears, all evaporates away. I, I would say that that's a great example of adapting to local conditions, but also somewhat hazardous because you've got to keep moving your house as <laughs> these flooding episodes occur. And anybody that's seen the Cagayan River in full flood in spring knows it can be bank to bank, not just from one side to another. So that's one example. Along coasts, um, I think there's some evidence for people moving inland at different periods. Uh, we don't have good control on this because the sites are ephemeral, but we get in the highlands, like in Cebu, for example, we find scattered sherds that mostly seem to be from 14th and 15th centuries from the coming from Thailand and Vietnam, replacing Ming uh, uh, materials in the Ming Gap. This could be a response to climate change during that period, could be a response to a slight increase in sea level. The geographer Patrick Nunn believes sea level rose again about a meter, 1,000 to 1,200 uh, AD. And that being the case, that would have been about the time that people may have been moving away from the shore uh, into the interior to avoid that. We're not really sure, and there's not enough data yet, but that's one possibility. Uh, be nice to be able to do more intensive surveys in the mountains with uh, opportunities to test a lot of those, uh, the periods of a lot of those little sites. Uh, then again, looking at mangroves and the changing shorelines, if we do examine like, like we did at Baxihi and the one slide I showed, 
the distances from the river and the yeah. settlements that were built, that will show that as well. So those are a few examples. Sorry, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, okay, next question. For Sir Bobby or Indianeda, what type of boats and ships did the Filipino tribes use for piracy and raids in China and Southeast Asia? How far can they go, by the way? Also, can you compare them to the Pacific Islander boats? You're on mute, Sir Bobby. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for the question. Um, in terms of archaeological um, evidence, we don't have much in terms of the uh, boats used for piracy and raids in China and Southeast Asia. Although there are historical documents that mention the Karakowa, the Balangay, the Juanga, that are used for raiding and trading. Um, and if you examine the Butuan boats, um, they're quite small, which um, in the past, they say it's only for uh, coastal trading, but as can be seen by the 2014, I think, Kaya ng Pinoy Foundation, which uh, reconstructed uh, the Butuan boats and traversed Southeast Asia and also China. So it means our ancient boats can do long distance ocean voyaging. Um, so there are, of course, we have to look for the evidence first uh, of these types of boats, um, except for the Butuan boats. And also, um, there are no research for now comparing them to Pacific Islander boats. So I, I don't know the answer to that for now. Thank you. Would there be plans to compare such? <clears throat> yes, there are always plans to, <laughs> to do <laughs> more research. But there's only three of us in the division for the whole country. So we need more people to do research. Okay. Thanks, Sir Bobby. Next question. This is from Miss Eva Theodora Sison. So I'm not sure if I missed any info on the Galleon trade and ancient textiles. Was this included in any part of the paper? So just curious. I think this is... This can be addressed to both presentations by Sir Bobby and Ms. Camille. Okay, I'll answer first. Um, there are yes, actually uh, mentions uh, of different kinds, kinds of textiles in China and as far as India that are part of the cargo of the Manila galleons that are transported from Manila to Acapulco in Mexico. So, yes. And then Ms. Camille. Um, we did a paper on the Bantam yeah. class primarily because it's um, uh, it's relative dating is uh, during the 13th to 14th century. So with that, um, it's during the galleon trade years. So, but about the but Sir Bobby answered the question a little bit. Okay, so um, the next question from Brian of Visilia. Hi, Sir Bob. Can you cite interesting discovery of your study regarding the ancient Butuan boat in Mindanao? What do you think is the impact of your study to the people living in the place? Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Uh, first of all, I am not really central to the Butuan boat um, secret investigations at this time because uh, in the 90s, 1980s, until the 2013, the study of the Butuan boats have been um, handled by the archaeology division of the National Institute of the Philippines. Um, but um, in terms of really delving into the study of the Butuan boats, I think the Butuan boats have shown us that ancient people as far back as the 8th and maybe earlier than the 8th century has begun building um, this very sturdy very nice boats that are for not only for uh, short distances but also long distance voyaging. And I think the impact of this is we can see from, from the people in Butuan now that they are it's fostering their identity. That uh, you know it helped them um, realize that they have very deep roots and they're capitalizing it now through tourism. As you can see that the Butuan boats is very well um, 
advertise um, as a, a tourism uh, aspect for, for, for the area. So I think from the 8th century until now, there is a connection uh, between the ancient population of Butuan and the uh, present population. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sir Bob, there's another question actually for you um, from the Zoom chat. So this is from Harold Banderida. The island of Panay, especially here in Capiz, we have a rich boat building tradition and the woods used are often in boat building, are mangroves and beach forest species like Dungun, Littoralis and Piapi. I want to ask her if there are also other types of wood being used to craft boats. I like those species in the like those species in the upland forest. Thank you, Carol, for the question. I think there are many types of boats that have been used to, to uh, types of wood that have been used to, to build boats, um, especially the hardwoods. And uh, during the Manila Galleon period. Uh, most of the hardwoods in Cavite have been harvested to build these boats. And when it was uh, it was gone, the forest were gone, they transferred back to uh, Sorsogon, where they had a lot of shipyards. And I think Panay was also involved in some of the historical period um, shipbuilding. So yes, there are many types of boats that can be used, uh, types of wood that can be used for um, different kinds of boats. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Bob. Um, I, would I would just like to read the answer from Ms. Tess, uh, Ms. Marita Staro on the question from Ms. Giovanni. So I will read it. Personally, and as part of the NMP, a cultural institution, our mandate is on the preservation and transmission of the weaving, but we cannot prevent the different groups if they wish to engage into the textile market. There are also bills being crafted by the by lawmakers supported by the cultural agencies, the NCIP, IPO Phil, that are into the protection of the craft, their designs, and the weavers. So hope that answers your question, Ms. Um, Giovanni Putong. Okay, so I guess the... We don't have, are there other questions from the q and I'm checking from our Facebook page also. So far we have comments. I'm uh, thanking our speakers for a very productive day for the very insightful presentation. So I think um, I have a question. <laughs> for um, address to Sir Bobby. So what are the future plans of the National Museum of the Philippines in the studies of the Butuan boats, since you mentioned that there is still much to be excavated from the site? Thank you, Audrey. Um, actually, it is our priority for much the, um, possibly next year, if you know, uh, the health situation improves and we can get uh, funding um, it is. We want to excavate more of the book one boat line, which is quite different from the other book one boats. Uh, so, as you can see from my presentation, is larger. It gives us a different um, wood species, and it's because it was only partially exposed. We still don't know much about uh, the difference between this boat and the other boats in terms of the boat building technology. So hopefully next year uh, we can start uh, re-excavating the Butuan boat mine. Thanks. And also uh, studying forward. not only the ship itself, but also the environment, such as uh, geological studies and, and, and maritime landscapes. Yeah, thanks. So looking forward to those, to that study <laughs> survived. <laughs> so, um, this question, we have a question addressed to Ms. Camille. So have you also looked into fabrics made of bagay fibers 
recently we have also received information here in Ilocos that how do I pronounce this? Magi fibers were also woven into fabric. Previously, we only knew that these were made into ropes. The information is still to be verified. Maybe you can also include it in your future research. Sorry, what fibers po? Mag magi magui. Magi. Magi magi fibers. I don't know the local. Is there a local term for this? Mm -hmm. But for to answer the question, uh, I haven't encountered. Again, uh, we just um, got other textiles from the National Infographic Collection, so it's limited to that. But for for future uh, researches or to um, learn more on the Bantong cloth, and it's it's uh, important to compare it to the other textiles. So thank you for that information. Maybe we can look into it as well as the one. Uh, as the other text I from practice mentioned earlier, the same thing. Ms. 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 Uh, so we have a question <laughs> from Dr. John. So would Maggie, Maggie have been introduced from Mexico? Maggie. Maggie. <laughs> Yeah, it's what they make tequila out of. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure so, Camille, I mean, maybe Ms. How Tess about, can yeah, that. <laughs> how about from your colleague? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, Ms. Yes. Uh, yes, we we have encountered magi as uh, as a rope in northern Luzon, particularly in Pangasinan. So we have also ethnographic collection on how the rope was made. But uh, for our paper, we have considered different factors such as we cut dyed uh, with the natural dyes and for funerary textiles. But uh, since uh, there are other uh, fabrics that are being used locally, uh, we can still consider magay in comparing the Banton cloth. So like what we did with the past fiber and the uh, raffia from Banton, which did not uh, uh, qualify into the other factors such as uh, ikat dye, but uh, you can also uh, consider magay as one of the uh, fibers. Okay, thank you, Pistes, for that answer. Um, there is another question for Ms. Camille. Are there comparisons from, are there comparisons or even contrast unique to the other textiles like the abaca of Kabikolan? or Bicol province to the shroud in your presentation. This is from Rusty Lynn Beltran. Then we ask them just to <laughs> answer as early daughter. <laughs> mm, historically, the Abaha fibers or Abaha woven cloth from Kabikulan are also considered as fine as that of the Banton cloth. But recently, uh, the other. But recently, what we see in the available uh, woven abaca cloth from Bicol are those that. So, okay, thank you. So, my question for um, Dr. Peterson. So you mentioned in your um, presentation that you found um, six more of the caves, so aside from the Marikondon cave, along Bohol Strait. So where exactly are these located? Well, they're they're scattered along. They're all the way from the northern end of Olongo, uh, and uh, then mm -hmm. down toward Bohol, and actually right across from the end of Olongo. I don't remember. Uh, Exactly. We, we visited a couple of them. A Andrea Halandoni and I went out to visit the other caves. They have smaller openings. They don't have that big arch 
cathedral opening that uh, Maragondon has, but they do have little areas where there could be pockets of soil in the uh, in the floor of the, of the caves. And they're all right about 40 meters below ground surface. So in other words, when, when that floor reef platform was exposed above sea level 100 uh, or 90, 91,000 years ago, basically that's when water flowing through the carbonate and the limestone made a cavern uh, and then uh, uh, that cavern was actually above water for many, many years. Of course, now it's below water. So there are lots of opportunities to look for things. We had hoped that uh, the U.S. Navy might come and uh, with some of their equipment during the Balakatan exercises, but the commander that was interested in that has moved on. Uh, we'll keep exploring uh, because uh, it's going to take some heavy equipment. Paul Allen was... Uh, of course, in the area of looking at the Leyte shipwrecks, and that that rig would have been capable, and 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 Frank Godio's rigs would be capable. We need to go down and do uh, some pretty heavy uh, uh, suction and cleaning, dredging. What do you think, Bobby? You ready to go? <laughs> ready when you are, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we just need big boats in there with the big equipment. Yeah. So, Sir Bobby, <laughs> do you have comments on that additional comments? This, this area of research uh, by John is basically very key to the Philippines. And as you have seen, the data from the Marigondon Cave, which I was a part of um, uh, excavating it, has yielded a lot of very vital information about climate change and also, uh, you know, at, at, during this period about 20,000 years ago. And I think if we investigate more of the part of the valley of caves in that area, uh, I think it will yield more interesting, um, not only environmental data, but possibly uh, artifacts. So it's it's very, very exciting to, to you know, to see the potential of this research. Thanks. Thank you, Sir Bob. Um, actually, I have a question also for meant for you and your team um, because part of your presentation was on the Lepa boat. So I'd like to um, ask how's the Lepa boat building tradition today? Um, we have is my co-author, um, which was Fernando in the panel. Maybe she can answer that. So maybe call on Miss Rose Fernando. You're on audio. Good morning, po. I have here with us a um, museum researcher natin who was with the team who collected the Lepa boats, Ma'am Pen. Can I know the question? Um, you have echo. Can we adjust your audio, Miss Rose? Yeah, the question is how is the Lepa boat building tradition today? Are we good now? The audio? Yes, Apo. Apo. See, Ma'am Tem is here with me. Uh, they want to know the process. They are using the traditional way of um, boat building and they are using pato, which is the general term for the ads. And presently, I think they are no longer um, be, uh, building this kind of uh, boat because of lack of timber. And um, usually before, because um, the wood or the lumber came from um, the forest of Tawi Tawi or from Saba, which is being flowed, uh, which is um, the result of the flooding, usually, the logs. I think it's already, it's not already. Please continue, Ms. Pam. Uh, it's already okay, I think. Okay. So you were saying that um, 
the building tradition still exists today. However, there is no more wood available. Yes, because uh, before okay. they depend also. Uh, yes, because uh, before they depend upon the um, uh, the timber or the trees that came from Saba and um, forest in Tawi Tawi. But due to this uh, limited um, trees or lim uh, limited um, timber, they are no longer they are no longer um, constructing it. In fact, some are already using the lightweight like um, plywood. So Tayud is one of the 15 houseboats, correct? Uh, the uh, LEPA that we, own, uh, we are exhibiting right now, uh, what was collected in 1992, I think, 1992 to 1998. And uh, that time, there was only a few numbers available. Um, available. So we are lucky that time that we were able to collect that uh, boat. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pham. So we have okay. here questions from the NQC Secretariat. Um, I think this is addressed to Ms. Camille. Have you ever encountered other textiles from other parts of the country? that have some evidence of development arising from interaction with Western technology? This is a question on, from the Zoom chat. Uh, no, we haven't encountered other textiles that has interaction with Western technology. So we have to look into it. Okay. So the next question from the Secretariat um, is for, I think, both is it possible for some wrecks to be upriver from the river opening, especially for navigable rivers? How about in the area of large lakes such as Laguna de Bari? So I think Sir Bobby and Sir John can answer this question. Are there, and then follow-up question, are there shared technologies between large seagoing vessels and those primarily used in riverine areas? Okay, thank you for the question. As of uh, the question of possibility, of course, uh, there is a huge possibility of, of some upriver wrecks to be, uh, there are the existence, existence of upriver uh, shipwrecks, but as of now, we haven't been able to locate it. But if you look at the Laguna de Bay, there are ancient settlements there, which are also catered to trade, um, not, um, including maritime trade. So, it's only a matter of time that we will be able to find um, these shipwrecks that are found up the river. So, barring the absence of, well, in the absence of this uh, evidence, we don't have any um, investigations into the shared technologies between the large seagoing vessels and the prime, uh, and also the riverine ones, as of this time. You know, I think. Uh, Would you like to comment? Okay. Thanks, Audrey. Yeah, no, I think the prospection technology would be really appropriate here, especially in big areas like Laguna de Bay. Uh, some kind of, some kind of, something like e electromagnetic resistivity or something. If it works in water, I'm not really sure. Uh, but even maybe sonar and so forth, used in a broad spectrum approach, could help maybe identifying locations like that because the water is fairly shallow. But another area I think would be fascinating to look would be in the Augustan Marsh, where there's peat, and there could be incredible preservation there if there are any cultural or maybe even human remains in that uh, environment, in that matrix of the preservation would be superb. But again, that would be an area where prospection, remote prospection, and by that I mean not radar, it wouldn't really work, but maybe EM or some of those techniques could work. Although water makes it difficult, but uh, it's worth, worth a try to find out something for a broad scale approach. Um, next question from, from Ms. Camille from Harold Benvenida. 
In the 18th century, Panay was famous for its textile industry, which produced a cloth called suerte and exported to Europe. Uh, we have Spanish documents telling us about the cloth, but sad to say we don't have any artifacts. We deduce it that is made of abaca. By the way, we discovered we have the red variety of abaca. So this is just a comment pala from Harold Benvenida. Um, so I'd like to ask all the speakers, uh, um, can, um, do you have any, um, okay, I'll just address this first to Dr. Peterson. So from among the sites you've studied, um, what usually drives the course of landscape change? to adaptation in settlements and how do we best approach these studies? So um, regarding pre-colonial sites. I'd say alternating patterns of aridity, stable climate and uh, extreme weather, floods and so forth. If you examine cut banks along any of the major rivers, uh, even streams, small local streams in the Philippines, you'll see alternating bands of maybe dark fine clay, which would be a paleosol when a soil was forming, and maybe right above it will be streamers of sand and gravel, which would have been deposited from high energy floods, scouring away the landscape above. And the landscape above might have been exposed because it was dry to a period of aridity or, or of dryness. And that makes the heavy rainfall even more damaging to the landscape. So it's those alternating patterns. The paleosols, the, the clay dark zones, would have been period of better climate. People could have grown plants reliably, could have lived on a stable land surface reliably in those. But then you'll see that they must have been terribly damaged and people would have been terribly endangered by those flash floods that deposited all the sands and gravels. So it's that alternating, the alternating patterns. And while some of them could be uh, predicted maybe by local communities, when we look at, for example, ENSO, El Nino and La Nina periods now is, is sort of predictive for that. So for a few years in a row, we might have dry conditions and then extreme storms that would have washed things into the, into the valleys. That would be an El Nino year. A La Nina year might be more stable. And then there are longer term cycles like that. More like El Nino, more like El Ni uh, La Nina, more like El Nino. So those I would say would be the biggest uh, impacts on settlement. It had to keep changing to adjust to that, especially when people were living in relatively simple village life ways and uh, relatively simple structures. Sir John, there is another question actually from, um, this is from Facebook. So in Bohol, there are tectites that have been found in Albuquerque, Bohol by some gemstone collectors. So what is the relationship of the tectites fights with climate change question from Facebook. Okay. Well, uh, if they're found there in Albuquerque, I don't know the, 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 uh, the context, the geological context, but there are mm -hmm. outcropping uh, areas like the Karkar Formation in Western Cebu, which is, by the way, the same period outcrop in Kalinga mm -hmm. area where the Kalinga rhino was found, the same period. Uh, around, uh, you know, early, mid, or early Pleistocene period or middle Pleistocene period. And this all happened, these tectites were spread when a, 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 a meteor a asteroid struck in southern China and it spewed this substance all over island Southeast Asia. Even, I, I think in Byers' work, he says some even got as far as Australia. So it was a huge uh, spread for these things. They would have landed on surfaces, land surfaces that were exposed during that period, right? Okay, so these surfaces would have been exposed, the Karkar formation. Others would have been as well. But then you have a process of uh, either being covered or, or, or perhaps uh, uh, exposed. So if you have the soil eroding away, then the tectites will be, it's called conflated, or they'll be, let's say, uh, it's a palimpsest deposit where where they're actually combined with rocks of, of earlier ages that are eroding away. So that land surface could have been somewhat even older than when they landed, but then they're gonna be preserved in that context. Now, where we find them though, we wanna then look for some land surface that would have been coeval with the asteroid, with the tectites, 
And that would be where we might hope to look for extinct fauna like the rhino or human remains. And actually near Badian in that field, there are some crudely uh, uh, fashioned, well, I'm not, that's jumping ahead of the story. If they're fashioned, we're not really sure, but there are some crude uh, limestone uh, 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 clasts that could actually have been worked in the same deposit that the tectites were found. So we'd really want to carefully look at that and see if in fact that's true. It's, it's vague and hard to tell with limestone, uh, but it's possible. So in Albuquerque, uh, I'd be happy to take a look at the geological context there, but I'd say there is a possibility. And uh, since that's an area where there's also some really large caves and things, that's an area that we'd really be seriously wanting to examine very, very early human settlement. And did we lose Dr. John? I'm here. Okay, okay. thank you, Sir John. Um, I think for the last <coughs> question for Q&A, this is for Ms. Camille. So from Brian Abisilia, I'm a bit curious since I am a Bicolano Kanayas mom, Camille, is Abaca textile still in demand in the market internationally? Um. According to Ms. Tess, uh, during the Spanish and American period, yes. But nag-decline na yung ang baka plantation, even in, in Indonesia. So the book of E.P. Siebert on the story of Ambaka might help. Pero now, um, I'm really not sure. I cannot speak for um, uh, if it's in demand in the market, especially internationally. Pero... In the south, especially in Mindanao, about our weavers, uh, they're still in production. So about being sold internationally, I'm not sure. But locally, I think yes. So Ms. Camille, based on your presentation, um, uh, I think abaca ikat textile is common in Mindanao at present time. So what is the implication of its early presence in Banton Island, Romblon? Um, we're still uh, looking into it, um, pero the evidences uh, with our collections, um, the ikat dyed abaca textiles are most uh, are common in Mindanao. So we're thinking that the this is not uh, I'm I'm not concluding anything, <laughs> but we're thinking <laughs> that the banton cloth is a trade cloth. From Mindanao, but we're not still sure. We have to uh, do more material analysis um, due to the uh, we we actually asked um, uh, an uh, institution to analyze the textiles, the two fragments, but they need a large sample, A4 size, so we cannot do that <laughs> because of the status as the as a nat national cultural treasure and. Uh, it's going to be invasive, so we're looking into non-invasive material analysis so we can uh, learn more about the textiles. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Camille. So um, I think that we have no more questions from the Q&A and from our Zoom chat. So... I would like to ask our speakers if they have um, questions for each other or um, at the same time, if you have a message that you'd like our audience to take away for today's session. Can we start with Sir Dr. John Peterson? Well, thank you for your attention, everyone. These uh, webinars are going on and on and on. Hopefully one day we'll be out of the pandemic and we can actually sit in the same room and talk to each other. But one thing that's been great about these kinds of sessions is that, for example, Bobby and I can sit in the same space and Camille and I can sit in the same space where otherwise one of us would have had to have traveled all the way between Manila and Cebu. And this makes it a lot easier for that kind of sharing. So we'll, we'll try to appreciate the good parts of this and hope for a uh, days soon when we can actually get together, uh, ideally out in the field, doing some field work together, drinking a cold SMB, and uh, that's what I'm uh, looking forward to. Thanks all. So from, thank you, Sir John, for, from Sir Bobby. Uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar. I know this has been 
like the 1,000th time that we have attended such conferences since the pandemic began. And my paper basically does a spotlight on Mindanao, which has not been covered so far in terms of um, the underwater cultural heritage. And I hope you learned a lot. And as John would have said, you know, physical conferences are definitely better than the online ones, but uh, we have to make do with, with what we have. And I think it has also opened a lot of avenues in terms of information dissemination uh, in conferences such as this. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Sir Bobby. And Ms. Camille? Hi, on behalf of my uh, colleagues with our paper, we'd like to thank everyone for attending this conference, for the good questions, and for um, giving us ideas on the other textiles that we could compare the Bantan class with. So, um, again, we're open for collaboration. Um, Actually, I want to say that we are actually supporting sustainability by doing this uh, conference online. We don't have to get into planes, you know. <laughs> so that's one good thing about doing this online. And we, uh, it's actually uh, like a crowdsourcing. Uh, we get information from our uh, audiences as well. So it's nice to collaborate with uh, the audience. It's easier. I think it's more organized when it's online. So thank you again. And we're... Um, uh, we have to do a lot with our paper. Um, we hope for your support as well, and we hope to see you soon in the next conferences. So thank you, everyone. So thank you. Thank you to our dear um, speakers and uh, speakers and to our participants for actively sending in their questions. So I hope we had a productive morning and Hopefully all your questions were answered. And if you have more questions later today, you can still um, send them to the Zoom chat and the Q&A portion of this um, in the Zoom. So again, thank you and hope you uh, enjoyed the rest of the session today. Thank Back you all to you, Marisa. Yes. Thank you, Audrey, for facilitating the plenary discussion. Thank you, yes, Dr. Thank Peterson, you Bobby, Michelle. Pleasure, Camille, Test, and Pam for sharing your invaluable knowledge, and to all participants who joined and made our morning session interactive. Now let's have a lunch break. But before we leave, please be reminded that our afternoon session will start at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch and see you later. Sa iyong damdamin ipamalas Ang ang tinggaling Tumayong bunta pa Ang harapin ng buhay At kapin ang tagumpay Tulungan ang kapwa't bigyang halaga Huwag hatakin ng pababa Isipin huwag sana ang sarili